I'm going to call this meeting to order. Believe it or not, uh, it's not just me. There's two people on the phone, so we do have a quorum. Uh, Councilman Gates, are you there? Yes. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor? I'm here. Okay, then we are calling this meeting to order. Uh, I need a motion on the approval of the February 17th uh, subcommittee meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. I now need um, same motion for February 25th meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Item three is for information only. It is on the Metro Regional Public Transportation Authority and MAG meetings. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Hearing none, uh, item four, I believe Councilman Gates, you wanted to pull that? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, so item five, um, we will, I, did, uh, Councilman Gates, did you wanna hear it later or did you uh, wanna take it totally off the agenda today? Yeah, would you mind if we just heard it a little later? I'll be at uh, City Hall in about 10 minutes. Okay then we will just leave it on the agenda. Item five is a consent item to enter into an agreement with ABM facility services to provide transit facility maintenance services. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion. Item six is amending chapter five of the Phoenix City Code cable television licenses. Debbie? we got a whole crew here, uh, crew? Madam Chair, uh, Council Members, uh, Rob Sweeney and Jeff Williams from the IT Department and Paul Lee from the Law Department have been working feverishly on this issue. Um, this is really an opportunity for us to update our cable television license ordinance to uh, get into the modern world a little bit and address some issues that have come up over time. Uh, they will describe it to you. I will mention that all of our incumbent providers have provided us input on this ordinance as well as those who have uh, discussed with us uh, entering this market. And uh, I think all of them are represented here today and may have something I've to say about it. I've noticed a couple it. in the audience. So, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over to Rob and they've got just a very brief presentation for you. Okay, thank Great. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Neymar. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we're here in front of you today seeking your support uh, for the changes as, as, as Rick had mentioned in regards to changing uh, Chapter 5 of the City Code, dealing with cable television licenses. Uh, just to give a, a, a little bit of a level set uh, for the community, uh, the, based on uh, the changes and the, and the technical uh, evolution of cable television within the, within the country, uh, there is a layered approach or a tiered approach to the regulatory authority of the services provided on that same technical infrastructure. Uh, for the information service, or think about internet, if you will, that is a regulatory authority is at the FCC. For your, your standard telephony, uh, uh, landline telephone, that is actually governed and regulated out of the Arizona Corporation Commission. And for the cable product or the video services, that is a local uh, control item. And for the city of Phoenix, that is governed under Chapter 5. So we just wanted a level set for the community itself. Uh, oftentimes, we will get phone calls about other elements of service uh, and they want to have some conversations about that, but Chapter 5 deals with the video product uh, solely and the construction thereof. So the major provisions of the Chapter 5 are actually uh, provided to us through federal law and through state law, which then we can enact certain local ordinances to control and regulate and establish processes by which we will license those providers that provide uh, cable television services to the city. Uh, the, the general terms of the and uh, high level terms of the ordinance itself for the code itself speak to how one would go to become licensed, the company would be licensed, speaks to different standards and schedules dealing with customer service, uh, dealing with construction uh, in the rights of way, how they will manage with that, uh, speaks to uh, the license provisions or license fee provision uh, of no more than 5% of the gross revenues uh, of uh, the cable service. Uh, talks about the government and uh, public access channels that will be granted uh, uh, through the licensee uh, to the licensor of the City of Phoenix. And with that, also talks about the license application process. So there are general provisions and some very detailed provisions of the chapter, uh, of, of Chapter 5. 
Uh, there are certain elements that we needed to kind of bring into the modern age. Uh, last time we uh, adjusted the code was in 2008. And uh, to kind of go through those items in a high level are Jeff Williams and Mr. Paul Lee from the Law Department. Jeff. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, staff is recommending the adoption of proposed changes to City Code Chapter 5 to better reflect the current state of the cable TV industry, as Rob mentioned. Um, the proposed changes include clarifying that Chapter 5 covers not only traditional cable TV services, but also covers the provision of similar video services, um, regardless of the technology that's used. Updating the definition of gross revenues to match current state law emphasizing council's authority to negotiate licenses that bring the most benefit to the cities and residents, and updating outdated language and legal jargon. Um, as Rick uh, just mentioned here, um, staff has provided uh, draft language to all of the, 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 the two current providers, Cox Communications and CenturyLink, and also to a potential new entrant into the Phoenix market. We did incorporate their input into the final draft. Um, any existing licenses with, uh, actually that would be with Cox Communications and CenturyLink will not be affected by these ordinance changes until those licenses are renewed in the future. The next slide. Um, at this time we're asking um, the Transportation Infrastructure Subcommittee to recommend full city council approval of staff's proposed changes to chapter five of the city code. Do you have any questions? I do. Okay. How often are the licenses renewed? Uh, what's the term? The, the general term of licenses can be up to 15 years. We do have a renewal upcoming with Cox Communications at the end of calendar year 2017. We very recently, June of last year, renewed the CenturyLink license. Okay. Thank you. Can you be a little more specific on what some of the proposed changes are? Sure. Certainly, uh, Madam Chair, uh, there are certain language uh, provisions in the ch in the code that were kind of outdated. So when it, the definition of cable, uh, uh, the definition of cable television was speaking to the technology at the time. Okay. So we are now broadening that uh, to include things like video services. So the, the way in which the cable product is transmitted over the technology to the end user, to the citizens themselves. So it was it was a bit narrow or a bit archaic, if you will, and not inclusive of things that uh, uh, new entrants might be looking to provide uh, to the community uh, that when you're talking about just a cable television product that in federal law is very specific as to what it means and it does not necessarily include things like a video service provider. So we wanted to make sure that the ordinance uh, in Chapter 5 uh, allowed for those new entrants to provide that service under the conditions of Chapter 5. Anything else? Uh, there were other changes, uh, as, as Jeff had indicated, gross revenues. We wanted to make sure what it was inclusive of and what it was inclusive not of in very detailed fashion uh, in, in the draft uh, changes, which was attached to the City Council report. Uh, other items, which is changing uh, some legal language, that not really substantive changes, but to bring the, the code uh, up to par to what other uh, changes are out there. I don't know if Mr. Paul Lee, if you'd like to add uh, to that from a legal perspective, what those changes may be. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the uh, subcommittee. I think one major change is that we made it clear that this council has discretion to negotiate individ individual contract with, within certain confines. Because the te technology is constantly evolving, it'd be helpful for, it's difficult for us to come back and change the code every single time when there's some te new technology coming in. So we made a statement, a provision there clear that the council can negotiate certain terms out of the like, out of the ordinance and input certain other terms in here so that the council can, the city and the council can catch up with the technology without having to come back to you, staff coming back to you every single time when there's some technology involvement that needs some modification of the code. I think that's one thing we strive to do and we, we, we did that in here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see we have representatives from Cox and from Century Lake. Did you want to make comments? No? You're both fine with this, I take it? All right. In that case, do I have a motion? I move um, the recommendations uh, to amend Chapter 5 of the Phoenix City Code entitled Cable Television Licenses. Do I have a second? Sorry. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Councilman, did you have any questions? I did not. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much.
Uh, it takes us to uh, the Tiger Grant application. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, subcommittee members, um, the federal government is go doing, getting ready to do another round of uh, Tiger Grants. We were extremely, extremely lucky to be awarded one. I think there were reasons for that. It had to do with one of our council members' uh, uh, parents being very involved in, uh, in leaving Congress. I don't know. That might have been a little bit of a help. Uh, but anyway, we were very lucky to get a, a wonderful Tiger Grant for the uh, <laughs> South Phoenix Light Rail Corridor, and that's underway now and just really exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, w w you don't get one every time. Uh, in fact, we've uh, applied many times and haven't gotten one, but uh, we as city staff sort of uh, looked through what it was we thought might work in the transportation world and fit the important criteria that Tiger has. And we think we've got a, a, another very good application that we'd like to recommend, that you recommend to this, the full council that we apply for. Um, there are other uh, regional uh, submittals that will happen as well within this region. So we'll, it may, you know, if our region gets one, it may not be this one. But we felt that this was a very strong application, and we wanted to go ahead and get your approval to submit it. And I'm going to turn it over to Ray and uh, Kerry Wilcoxon to talk to you about it from the streets. Very good. Thank you, Rick. Um, Madam Chair and, and subcommittee members, thank you for the, this opportunity. This is pretty exciting news, uh, another opportunity to go after another um, potential federal grant. Uh, last month, the notice of funding availability came out from the US DOT for more than $400 million across the, the whole country. So there's a great opportunity for us to be in line to, again, possibly get a, a, a grant. Um, this grant opportunity has to, is going to be a competitive basis. Uh, the projects have to be, have a significant impact to the, uh, to the nation, region, and metropolitan areas. Uh, so some of the topics that, that, that are focused on is generating economic development and access to transportation, connecting employment and education services and other opportunities, and then building off existing multimodal uh, transportation networks. So one of the things that we did to try to Get, get ahead of this and trying to develop this grant was we actually had a conference call with the US DOT and they were very pleased on, on the type of project that we were going to be doing and uh, especially when we're leveraging a lot of the other inf investments that the city and the federal government is doing with, with reInvent Phoenix. Uh, also with all the multiple partners that we're engaging for this particular project. So I'm going to have Kerry Wilkinson, uh, one of the lead project team members, uh, talk about what we're looking at for this, for this submittal. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, this is a very exciting project. It's one that I've been working on for, uh, for a while. Uh, this is the, the Grand Canal Scape, uh, phase two, basically. Uh, the map that you see here shows the uh, Grand Canal from I-17 to the Tempe border and uh, shows that it runs through a number of areas of, uh, of interest in the last, uh, last few years, including the, uh, the reInvent Phoenix, uh, the Plan Phoenix, uh, there are also, throughout this network, there are numerous connections, either existing or planned, for the Bicycle Master Plan. And uh, we're working on, it, on uh, complete street projects in a lot of these areas as well. As Ray mentioned, uh, this project, uh, the Tiger Grant um, uh, process, is focusing on uh, projects that would um, make uh, access to education, employment, uh, neighborhoods, um, economic drivers um, of the communities um, more viable to the people living along the core. And we believe this project uh, meets those, those, uh, those needs. If you're familiar with what we're doing now, uh, we have a project going on that is known as Grand Canalscape Phase 1 uh, that basically uh, touches on the areas in red above. It's around three and a half miles of trail, multi-use trail, uh, lighted trail and uh, signalized crossings um, through um, the uh, uptown region, the Gateway North region, and the um, uh, Green Gables neighborhood in, uh, in East Phoenix. Uh, it's around three and a half miles long. It includes six signalized crossings, which we believe will be the key to the project to make, it, uh, make the trail more functional. Uh, if we were to get approval for this uh, project, the Tiger uh, portion, phase two, would actually link everything we've, do, we've been doing in phase one and provide a contiguous uh, multi-use trail from the Tempe-Phoenix border in the east all the way to I-17. So at, 
on completion, it would be possible for you to get on the canal in Tempe and ride um, across town using uh, the trail, signalized crossings, um, and neighborhood links uh, all the way into down or all the way into uptown Phoenix uh, and uh, into the neighborhoods that surround those areas. The uh, Tiger funding would be uh, approximately $10 million we'd be asking for, and we would have a uh, one third match on that, uh, roughly $3 million from SRP aesthetic funds, $2 million from existing bicycle master plan funds. Uh, the application deadline is June 5th of this year, so we have a very short timeline. Uh, we would receive approval if we were approved in October. Uh, we would have design completion by December of 2016, uh, about four months or three months after the grand opening of phase one, uh, and then obligation of funding for construction by June 2017 with completion of the project sometime around spring 2018. So the Street Transportation Department recommends that the TNI subcommittee um, approve the submission of the federal application for Tiger funding for Grand Canal Scape Phase Two. You have questions, Councilman? Madam Chair, thank you. Um, Carrie, thanks for your great work on this project. This um, uh, bicycle uh, path that, that would be put in as part of the, was that on the bicycle master plan? Was this one of the projects that was identified when that came through earlier? It was. The canals um, in general uh, were part of the bicycle master plan. Um, I'd like to stress, though, that uh, apart from uh, the bicycle aspects of this, this has also been driven uh, pretty heavily by the neighborhood groups around the, uh, the area. Uh, they see it as a way to use the canals uh, in, a, in a safer way, uh, but also to link uh, the canals, the bike paths, and the existing uh, pedestrian pathways to the, uh, to the Grand Canal in a, in a better way. Um. Madam Chair, one of the, so there's great work that's been done on the Arizona Canal several years ago. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, we've had some, some concerns and complaints from, from folks in that area that, you know, we haven't done a great job of, of keeping that up with, again, all of our uh, different uh, responsibilities in the city and, and, and limited funding. So I guess the question I had, I saw there was $3 million on aesthetics funds from SRP. I'm just wondering, is there any assistance that we might be able to get for some of the upkeep along the Arizona Canal as we're you know, looking at now expanding this to Grand Canal? Uh, I'm thinking that's a, a larger area to spread our limited funds across. So that, that does raise some concerns for me. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, if there might be some assistance we might uh, be able to get up to the work that the areas that have already had some great multimodal uh, trails put in on the Ari along the Arizona Canal. Sure, um, uh, Councilman and, and Madam Chair, uh, we uh, this is a, an area that we're uh, we're very concerned about in streets as well. Um, and in fact, I, I just spoke with uh, SRP yesterday about um, not one of these two canals, but uh, the High Line Canal, uh, an area of concern along the High Line Canal. Um, there's two areas that we're looking at uh, through streets that would um, hopefully address this. Um, first of all, in the design, where everything that we've been putting or we've been talking about putting in um, would be minimal maintenance. Uh, we're not talking about putting in landscaping. We're not talking about putting in um, uh, anything that would be too difficult to maintain on an up, on a ongoing basis. Um, that's been a source of contention. Uh, to some extent with some of the neighborhood groups that are also interested in this because everyone thinks of the um, Scottsdale waterfront whenever they think of canal. So we've told them, tried to manage expectations by telling them that's not what you're going to be getting. Uh, but that being said, we fully anticipate that there will be some um, landscaping or something that will need maintenance. Uh, the lights alone along the canal path will, will most likely uh, need some kind of maintenance. Um, we are working on existing resources. Uh, we have contracts to do some of the maintenance on, on our um, freeway uh, landscaping uh, that would um, hopefully encompass um, this area. Uh, but the second thing that we've, um, we've noted, and this is, a, uh, this is an area of, um, that may be making the issue a little bit more um, cloudy, is the, uh, the difference in jurisdictions. Um, this is SRP right of way, which means it's federal right of way. Um, the city can, and with SRP's blessing, build whatever they want on the uh, canal within, within reason. Um, but once it gets to the city, the question of who maintains it um, is the gray area. And um, 
we uh, have been uh, working with parks on what to do with the canalscapes in general. Um, one idea was to uh, make the canalscapes a um, type of street so that the um, uh, jurisdiction is clear mm -hmm. um, uh, and the, um, the issue about who maintains them is um, a, little more, uh, a little more precise. That doesn't generate money, um, but it is something that we are looking at and it's something that uh, we're hoping we have uh, we can uh, come up with a way to uh, continue to maintain um, the canals. We, we do keep a good, uh, or we, we have been able to maintain the canals fairly well up to this point. Uh, we're looking to expand it, obviously, and we want to make sure that we, um, we compensate for that with our, um, with our maintenance. Well, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for that background. I think uh, I'm encouraged by hearing you say, you know, we might try and make it very clear, the lines of authority very clear and put it under streets. And with the recent uh, change that the council approved with uh, streets taking over that responsibility of, of, uh, of taking care of the landscaping and all that, I assume this will be the same and, and being, you know, three times a year proactive as opposed to reactive responding to complaints. I, I, I would be very supportive of that and hopefully that's something we can could move forward uh, pretty quickly. So thank you, Madam Chair. Councilwoman, I have a question um, leading me to maintenance because um, if you look at the, I don't know which slide it is, five, four, um, it, five. In funding, um, it's about the infrastructure is there any way way that we can put some um, designate some dollars for maintenance of the canal um, of the current that we are doing currently? And uh, I know in the future we probably couldn't do that because it, it'll be done by spring 2018. But maintenance is a key uh, in order to keep these uh, canalscapes beautiful, vibrant, and uh, alive. Um, so is there a, a line item in anybody's budget? Uh, and I'm assuming it's no longer in parks, it's now in transportation since we moved 21 positions over and have done all this great savings in order to maintain our area that uh, the canals are part of this? Madam Chair and Councilwoman Pastor, uh, right now, as we've talked about with the landscaping, we are moving ahead with that process. Keep in mind that uh, the remainder of those funds, to we're going to be doing a, a uh, issue for bid for ultimately getting that, that service. So we're kind of still going through that process. Uh, with regards to just in general maintenance for the street transportation, I think there's several options that we can look at and put on the table uh, with regards to our current maintenance that we have for funding. But also I think there's an opportunity for the private, uh, possibly a public-private partnership where we could work with a lot of, there's a lot of um, private entities along the canal that there could be sort of the same thing that we do right now with Adopt a Street. Maybe there could be a possibility for getting some partnerships with the schools, with the uh, private entities that are along there that maybe could help us in some of the maintenance aspects. So I think we're going to be exploring that as we come, you know, we, we go ahead further with, with these projects. So, Madam Chair, just to add one other thing, I think you know this behooves a deeper conversation uh, among staff to kind of sort of sort through what are our options, maybe do a little inventory of all the canal bank miles and, and sort of uh, do a scan of the maintenance issues. Some of them are going to be the responsibility of private property owners who are responsible for maintaining their own, you know, their landscaping that might overhang or whatever. But as we go to improve things, there are different types of maintenance issues that come up, like sweeping. Uh, a bike path and, and that kind of thing. So, and Councilwoman Pastor and I recently rode. <laughs> That's where I was going to uh, go. <laughs> at least 10 miles, and much of it was on uh, uh, our canal banks. And there are a lot of issues. And and uh, so we'll we'll do a good uh, deep dig on this. And and maybe it, the right way to handle it is it in preparation for next year's budget process. We would think about you know how if whether there is an allocation that we would recommend to. Uh, include in in that process and then obviously along with this whenever we open a new street we set aside money now for the street <clears throat> landscape maintenance if we have redone the landscape so that may be another opportunity if we were to get this grant I, I have a question Ray uh, as the mileage grows uh, for this bike path are there 
any places along there that have um, access to public safety? I mean, if you had an emergency, is there a call box? Is there any routine police officer or someone that bikes down it? Madam Chair, that's a great question. Uh, at this point, I'm not too sure if that's uh, available. Uh, I know we don't have call boxes along uh, the, co the corridors, but uh, I do believe that in certain communities, certain neighborhoods, they do have police that that go around the communities. But on a regular basis, I don't I don't think they, that happens. So, um, right. do you have anything? To um, add, Madam Chair, uh, committee members, um, we have uh, just begun the planning of the uh, phase one. And uh, that did come up during the initial discussions. Uh, do we want to have some kind of security? Uh, it will be lit, lit uh, but if it's a, um, you know, someone falls or hurt, hurts themselves, uh, that was a concern. Um, so um, we haven't actually discussed um, call boxes, but it probably isn't a bad idea. We are bringing electrical onto the canal, um, so there will be an opportunity for that um, to be added um, starting in phase one. Uh, so it's it's not a bad idea, and it's actually something that we can incorporate. We're early enough in the process that we can actually incorporate that um, into uh, into plans for phase one. Well, uh, just for me, I will tell you, I'm supportive of uh, applying for the grant, but I would request that you come back to this committee by fall, and one um, designate who's responsible. Is it streets? Two. Um, how you're going to maintain it, and three, incorporate safety measures in the process. I'm sure I think all those are, are all those are certainly doable, and they're part of the natural process that we're going to have to go through as this moves forward anyway, or as phase one moves forward. Any other comments, questions, or motions? I move uh, that the TNI uh, committee accepts uh, funding or accepts approval uh, to submit the Federal Transportation Investment, the Tiger Grant application for phase two of the Grand Canalscape project. I would second that with the, with the, uh, with, with the additions. With the additions. Okay. With the additions mentioned by the chair. Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll see you this fall. Um, next is the West Phoenix. And, oh, we could wait. Let's go back and do the Ellen. MacArthur Foundation membership. Great. Uh, Madam Chair, John Trujillo and Ginger Spencer are here, and they can, uh, Mark Hartman, uh, and uh, they're prepared to either do a quick pre overview of this or uh, and just answer any questions that you might have. Why don't you do a quick overview? Great. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you. Um, the, the item before you today that we're talking about, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation membership, is a, is a membership that is by invite only. And currently, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has invited uh, five cities, only five cities um, worldwide. And there's only three cities within the United States that have been invited, which is New York City, Palo Alto, California, and the city of Phoenix. And then there's other, on a, I think, in Europe that have been invited to this. So, and the reason why we feel this is important is, is because, well, let me, let me step back a little bit. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation is a program that focuses on circular economy, not only with businesses, but as well as with um, cities. And the circular economy is, is, a, is a concept that is being mentioned on an international basis. And there's many companies now that have felt that this is a valuable concept that they're moving towards. Uh, Procter & Gamble is a good example. Unilever is a good example. And what they're realizing is that garbage is going to be the most valuable commodity in the 21st century. And so what they're trying to do, and they're realizing, why do they make a product and then red, they, residents use it and then they just throw it away or landfill it? So, so their goal is to create a product, and not only that, but to educate and communicate to residents on being able to receive that product back so they can use it as a resource into their process again. And that's what this goal of, of this program is, and it's to educate, communicate, as well as provide some funding available as part of this foundation and other foundations within these large corporations to deal with this circular economy. 
And so they have asked us, because of what we're doing here and because we are becoming a leader on an international scale on what we're doing here in the city of Phoenix and creating this circular economy, as well as what we're doing with the, the resource, the RIC campus, as we call it, <laughs> uh, down that at 27. That was the great name yeah, you came up with. Yeah. The 27th Avenue and Lower Buckeye. So this is becoming, they're aware of this, and this is why they've asked us to become a member. Okay, hey, now for the, the loans that you were talking about or the startup funds, if I recall, you're inviting uh, entrepreneurs to come on campus and be very creative and use your product to correct. make a new product that can go back out and start the circle. That's correct. As, as we mentioned earlier in other forums, uh, the majority of our material that we manage here in the city of Phoenix, our process, it either gets buried or it gets shipped to China. And again, as part of the circular economy, we want to create businesses, we want to create jobs, and this economic development here in the city of Phoenix, and use the products and the materials here locally. And that's what the goal of this circular economy is. It's part of our process. And the closed loop fund is part of this program that we've been talking about. And they want to provide a funding source for not only those businesses that want to locate here, but a funding source for us as the city of Phoenix on uh, dealing with infrastructure needed to create their circular economy as well. So, so as you know, Madam Chair, so memberships you know, are always a question or an issue. And it's not cheap. It's $50,000. Um, we honestly believe in this particular case that this membership is going to be of great value to us in marketing our what we've what we're doing, what you just decided to invest mm -hmm. in. Um, at your next subcommittee meeting, you're going to have all of the results of the a call for innovators and RFP, and you're going to see what the tremendous outpouring is, and um, and we want our reach to be to go farther than that. We want to be able to be global and national. And this, we believe this membership is an investment in helping us to do that so that we can, uh, we can do what we said we wanted to do with this resource campus, which is to take things that we're currently paying a lot of money for, polluting the environment by doing so, by driving trucks, et cetera, and, um, and instead, turn them into uh, products so that we're actually either, first of all, we have the cost avoidance of not hauling it to the landfill, not spending money on trucks and gas and burying it and environmental compliance. And instead, uh, people may be buying these resources from us or uh, at least taking them off our hands and turning them into process to, to uh, new uh, products that um, you know, will both be helpful for the environment, but also helpful for our bottom line, for our rate paying customers. So even though just on, in, in general, you know, $50,000 membership sounds like a lot of money, and it is, um, we, we view this really as an investment in, our, in, in the direction we're going here with our uh, Reimagine Phoenix 40 by 20 program. And, and Madam Chair, to follow up on that, a good example that we found out a study that the state of Georgia did a study and they, they, their study shows that they spent $100 million to bury material that could have produced $300 million in revenue, as a good example of this process. Councilman Gates? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I've obviously been supportive of, of the RIC, uh, so now this is uh, what, what it's going to be called. Uh, how can I not support that? Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, the responses uh, that we have from this process. But I'm just specifically, you know, concerned about this particular membership. Um, so are there any other, it sounds like they've invited others, but th are there actually any other cities that are current members that have forked over the 50,000 or? No, the, the, the other cities that they invite, they're going through the same process we are at this time. So okay. New York City and Palo Alto. So it depends on the timing. We could be the first city on the international scale that could become a member. Already, ASU locally has become a CE a pioneer, pioneer university. university. So they've only allowed so many universities. So, so far, I think there's been two university that have been accepted, and ASU is one of those universities that have been accepted as part of this process. And just to clarify, there are um, cities in Europe who have accepted mm -hmm. and become members of the CE100 list, um, but we would be the first um, 
city in the U.S. to become a member if you approve this membership. Um, and again, uh, noting what John said with Arizona State University, we just found out last week that they're going to be one of their um, pioneer universities. So Okay. And so is there a financial commitment for ASU? Not part of it. Um, from the university level, I don't believe so. Yeah, I don't believe so. But the one thing that would be u unique about us is with Arizona State University and if the city of Phoenix were to participate, we would be the first region where it's the university and the city going forward with mm -hmm. this membership. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so cities have to pay but universities don't? Is that how it works? Or That's what we think is happening at this time. Okay. Correct. Um, and why the three-year term? Where does, is that, did we come up with that suggestion or? No, that Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Gates, no, we did not. That's part of their, their terms as to be a member of uh, CE 100 Okay, I mean, do we know if they, I mean, because for me, if it, I, I just, I, I don't know what this group is. I mean, I've read about it, but I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I, again, I'm fully supportive of Rick and all that. I'm just, I'm just kind of struggling with uh, how this ties in with that. So I don't know, is there any, you know, if they would be willing to, hey, join up for a year, and then after a year, you come back to the council, and we can say, hey, here's what it's brought us, and then and then I would have no problem, you know, moving forward with an additional commitment. I don't know if that's a possibility or not. Um, I, from speaking with the um, individuals at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, I think they're very interested in having the city become a member. I think that is something that we can talk with them about to see if we can just make the one-year commitment and then come back to council for the future years. Um, and, and really what it's all about is a circular economy. It's going to allow us information to, um, to get information about best practices. For example, we're going to get the proposals um, for our call for innovators and we're going to bring that back to you. Um, but we were just meeting with some of their, their members and we we're having a discussion about, well, what do we do with textiles, with clothing, you know, that are currently in our garbage and recycling bin? And there was a young lady from London that said, oh, we've done this here and it's a best practice and here, here's a link to our thing. So that's some of the, the benefits of belonging to this membership is best practices on a global uh, level as well as uh, access to some of these Fortune 500 companies um, that perhaps would want to come uh, to our um, resource innovation campus or even to provide funding such as the closed loop fund. And, and, and back to your uh, question, uh, Madam Chair, Councilman Gates, I think as part of this process, what we can do is make sure as part of the council action that it would be a three-year term. We'd only approve the first year and the other years would ha we'd have to come back to get approval to spend the funding for that. And, and, and that makes sense. And by the way, I mean, I do want to congratulate you. Obviously, the fact that they have come and, and uh, recognized the city and asked the city to participate speaks to all the good work that's been done already. But I, I like the concept of... Um, of coming back to the council. I mean, the league, we don't approve the league for three years, right? The league has to come back every year. And I think mm -hmm. most, really, frankly, most of the memberships, uh, we, you know, to, to some of our chagrin, you know, we have to approve those on an annual basis. So that seems only appropriate that this would be consistent with that. And if, and if that's the way that we're going to, you know, move forward and maybe, um, uh, you know, maybe if the chair is comfortable, okay. I'd be happy to make the, the motion to that extent if it's just one year. Um, and, and see, you know, what bang we get for our buck. I, I want to recognize that I believe Councilwoman Gallego just um, came on the phone and has joined the meeting. And we are uh, backtracking to item four, which is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation membership item. Uh, so that. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. I do not. Councilwoman Pastor. I'm just, how long has um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation been in existence? Uh, um, Madam the Chair, member. MacArthur uh, Foundation in Chicago? Uh, this, no. Yeah, this is um, more of a, it's a European company. It's been around since 2013. And it's named for Ellen MacArthur, Dame Ellen MacArthur, okay. who yeah. used to ride boats and uh, while she was out there. Um, she became aware of the finite resources and wanted to do something about it. So in her retirement, created this foundation. Okay. Uh, my next question is, how many um, 
cities have been invited since 2013 to participate. Yes. Which so, cities have been invited? Yes. Um, Chairwoman Williams and Councilman Pastor, um, I can answer that question. So the CE100 membership is for 100 companies. They currently have 90 um, companies who have agreed to become members, such as Apple, Coca-Cola, and some of the other companies that um, John has mentioned, Close Loop Fund, that sort of thing. Um, most recently, they have reached out to five cities on an international scale to become members. Uh, so it would be so part, we would be part, part of, of the, that 100 members. So the five cities would be, um, I have three cities. So I have oh, New York, mm -hmm. Palo Alto, Phoenix. I'm mayor in Europe. And yeah. So they've also reached out to two um, European cities. And one that I do know that is currently a member is our little mayor. Um, and um, I don't know the other one. I, yeah. Yes. We can get that information to you, Councilman Pastor. When do you have to, uh, I guess, make a decision, or when do we have to make a decision as to uh, if we want to participate or not? When's the deadline date? From what I understand, there's there's no deadline right now okay. that they've set for us. They just, you know, we once we get the approval to move forward, then we start the process of applying and filling out the paperwork for the membership. Anything further? No. I. I would like to, I mean, if there is no deadline date, I would like to continue this so I could get some more information uh, before I vote on this because uh, this uh, foundation is fairly new and uh, I'm not, and no other cities, U.S. cities have participated and we would be the first city entering this and I want to find out about the ASU piece. There's a, I have a number of questions, but. Uh, I, I'm always agreeable to continue something uh, for a month. Uh, could you come back to us in a month and get Council. the information? Uh, Council, Council? Pastor, Madam Chair, if I could just add to this as well. I was actually in a meeting with, uh, with them last week and uh, just to speak to the credibility of the organization that it is the 100 largest multinational organizations and a pretty extensive list and they together have recognized the value of this and have put together a hundred million dollar fund so they are very committed uh, to uh, this gathering and they recognize and the speakers such as Procter and Gamble uh, did a looked at evaluated uh, 140 of their sites and recognized a two billion dollar savings and they are completely committed and recognizing and making commitments to going to 100% renewable energy, 100% uh, uh, recyclable material content in all the products they produce are very, uh, very serious and pretty prestigious as far as the, the Walmart and the Unilevers, the Dow Chemicals, and are, uh, it's a pretty good gathering, like a strong, you couldn't ask for a stronger gathering. Um, they represent, uh, when looking at globally, the global waste, 4.7, sorry, $2.7 trillion of waste and they, uh, that would be the world's sixth largest economy uh, if you looked at all the waste produced. And so they are very committed in recognizing organizationally that they are, uh, this will be truly uh, the, the impetus to move forward. So I, I strongly support and recognize the value in uh, the partnership in uh, joining this organization. Just wanted to- And I applaud you uh, and your staff, all of you, because uh, Phoenix has been known for decades as a leader, um, innovator, and uh, I think this is a prime example. You're stepping out in front. It's always a challenge to be one of the first. You're taking a risk, uh, but I will say I think we have a 99.9% .9 success rate in every time we've done that because you've always done your homework. So I'm very excited about seeing this happen and being part of this. I think it is... Uh, a showcase for Phoenix because I know you're going to pull off the rick uh, in a way that uh, will be globally known. So. so, Madam Chair, Council members, we're happy to continue this if you wish to the next meeting to be able to answer in more detail the questions that, uh, that some of you have asked. If there are any additional questions between now and the next meeting, just let us know so we can make sure we can address them. Um, we'll also connect with Councilman Gallego when she's back to make sure uh, if she's got any questions, uh, we'll be prepared to answer them as well. Okay. Any further comments? All right, then, if you will bring this back to us next month, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. We will now go back to item um, 8. Maria Hyatt, 
I believe, um, West yes. Phoenix Central Glendale Transit Corridor Study and Northeast Corridor Feasibility Study. Madam Chair and subcommittee members, um, as you know, we uh, have recently put together a very large uh, comprehensive transportation plan, which will be before the voters in August, uh, uh, called Proposition 104. Um, but in the meantime, we need to continue all of our good planning work. And um, two areas that we wanted to update you on today are the planning in the West Phoenix Central Glendale Dale Transit Corridor <laughs> area. I can't even say that, uh, which is mostly Councilwoman Pastor's district in the in Phoenix. A little bit, sort of the border of four and five, and depending on where you are, and then uh, the Northeast Corridor Feasibility Study which is again mostly in maybe all in council district three councilman gates district so um, it's a perfect subcommittee to be uh talking about the progress on these issues and are you saying anything or are we going right to albert well i am going to other than you stole it all okay my, sorry uh, no, no no that's okay i just <laughs> wanted to emphasize that um, the two projects we're talking about today continue our commitment um, that we made with the transit 2000 plan and Albert's going to give you an update on both of the projects. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Rick, um, uh, Chairwoman Williams, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, today, uh, I did want to start off with, with this map, uh, just noting I know you've seen it multiple times, but this one does have some slight modifications that I know are near and dear to this subcommittee and to, to the council. Uh, as Rick uh, outlined, the, the two areas that we're looking at today uh, for presentation purposes are the one that says 2026 there that has Glendale next to it, that gray shaded area, as well as 2034 that kind of connects around Central and Indian School heading out towards along the 51, heading up towards the Paradise Valley Mall. But one slight modification that I did want to show you as this map makes its way is you notice on the 2026 map for the second extension of the Northwest Phase 2, historically what you've seen is a map that was had the terminus on the east side of I-17. If you've noticed, we added one little hash mark there that now gets it across. Thank you. <laughs> to the west side of the I-17. And I know that is a major extra hash, or what I guess some of the youth would say today, hashtags or whatnot. And then also uh, what you saw in previous maps was a, was a corridor study area for the South Central Corridor. Now you notice there's an actual line because the city council and did approve an alignment for the South Central Corridor along Central Avenue. So I did want to just highlight those two as we uh, before getting into the actual presentation. So as stated, uh, we're going to talk today about the West Phoenix Central Glendale study and, uh, and then the Northeast Corridor as well. Uh, in regards to the West Phoenix Central Glendale study, just wanted to give you a quick background as regards to funding. Uh, like with most things, we have to talk about the, the funding before we can actually get studies moving. And so uh, for all the high capacity transit corridors within the city of Phoenix, that really started with the passing, the initial passing of the Transit 2000 tax. Shortly thereafter, one year after the city of Glendale passed a similar initiative, which allowed them to move forward with high capacity transit studies and our corridors in the future. And then what brings us all together, especially from the capital support, was when we had the regional tax pass in 2004, which was also known, which is also known as the Proposition 400. So between these three funding sources, both locally and at a regional level, that is what is being able to advance this particular study and advance it as it moves through the multiple steps that it will go through. So in regards to that, this is a snapshot of what we were doing between now and when we're scheduled to have revenue operations in 2026. And the big two questions that we always start off with on these particular processes are, what is the appropriate type of transit for this corridor? And then where does it need to be located? So throughout this entire time, obviously, we do a lot of work with the community and then do a lot of work looking at technical assessments and trying to answer those two questions. The green box that's highlighted there is where we are today. And uh, we hope to move through that just as quick as possible through the project development process. So a little more detail as to what we are doing for this part of the study. It involves what's known as in the federal government as these three tiers. And this is really just an overview of what they are going from a very macro perspective as to what are possibly the type of routes that would be within the corridor study area. This corridor study on the east is 19th Avenue and on the west is right around 59th, 67th Avenue. On the north was Northern Avenue, and then to the south was Camelback. So identifying what are any possible routes, and then starting to look at it, especially from a transportation perspective, what are the actual major destinations in this particular corridor study to make sure that from a transit perspective, are we best serving them? 
And then we get into the second round, a uh, second level of study and trying to figure out more specific things related to cost and population. And then ultimately in level three is when we hone in on what is required of us from the federal government. And we'll talk, I'll talk more about that later as to that's the work that we still need to be, get done. So when we started out at the beginning of the study, we had multiple options, which is reflected in this area, all the way again from northern down to south to Camelback, and really started looking at destinations. We know that the study did call for an actual terminus around the downtown Glendale area, which is located around 59th Avenue in Glendale. So that's why you see all lines moving into there on the west side of this. And then really looking at every possible arterial along the 19th Avenue corridor between what's currently operating now and then what will soon be operating once the Northwest Extension Phase 1 is completed and how do we best do that. One thing that became very clear early on in the study that although Northern was on the map, trying to utilize Northern as a means to get to the downtown Glendale area would force us to then backtrack almost a mile. So as we move from level one into the next slide, which is level two, that quickly fell off of the of one of the possible options, just given the additional cost and then this, the characteristics of what was going on in Northern. So as we started to look at level two, we got into some more details in, in comparing both Glendale, Northern, or not Northern, I'm sorry, Glendale, Bethany, and Camelback, and then all the destinations in between. We, we took a further look at capital cost for all three of those. We looked at some of the population and population trends. We also look at zero house, zero car households. What that tells us is the demand that the, the population would need for, for transit in that area. We also did look at the existing bus route ridership. And so when we started looking at those elements and moving from level two into level three, um, the two extensions for east west that would move from level two to level three would then go from would be Glendale and or Camelback. And this is truly where we are today. We are we will now be looking at six different areas in regards to the Glendale corridor as well as Camelback. To be very specific, looking at cost effectiveness, what's going to be the cost of either one of these alignments versus uh, the, the type of transit that would be provided and the ridership. Also be looking at employment centers. What are the origin and destinations for the individuals in this corridor? Obviously, we know there's a strong connection between where people are living and where people are working. We know that there's a strong connection with education as well. We've seen that time and time again on a daily basis with our current light rail system. And then also working with the community, we want to try to find ways, depending on which one is selected, how do we minimize impacts on the community? Primarily, that's what are the right of way impacts and how can we find ways to minimize that type of an effect on the community? Um, and then now ec with economic development and land use. So what are some of the opportunity, opportunity corridors in this section? So as we begin to look at all of those different elements and those all coincide with what the federal government would be rating this project on, we will then be coming back. The, the goal is to come back at the first quarter of 2016 with the final recommendation. Today, we're not here for any action. We're just simply giving an update and, and information. And, and this is the information that we'll be taking out to the community. And, uh, and where we are currently with this particular corridor. Um, I just want to emphasize a couple of points. So in the map that was adopted as part of the Proposition 104 plan, they didn't show any giant study areas as part of the map. They just picked a, picked a line and put it there. Um, so on that map, it shows Camelback Road as the line. Well, the study area is actually still a much bigger area and so I just wanted to make that clear to you in case people ever ask you any questions about it. We haven't selected the specific route yet, although I will tell you that the committee was very interested in connecting employment and education corridors and in particular in this corridor is Grand Canyon University sitting right on Camelback Road uh, between 40, 35th and 43rd. So that will, will be a major tug and pull in the process. But just to be clear, Glendale is still uh, an option that is being studied. And just because the line is very specific on the map, uh, on the ballot, the study corridor is much larger than that. The second thing I want to mention is at Councilwoman Pastor's request, um, the economic development staff, Albert, myself, um, have begun working on looking at uh, a revitalization area here in terms of economic activity. You know, it's, it's much better to get the economic planning piece right 
ahead of uh, as we do as we go into making these final uh, study processes for the actual line alignment. So as an example, at her request, we met with the car dealers who were along uh, Camelback Road to understand what their issues and concerns were with regard to if the route were to go down Camelback or whether, you know, what their <coughs> thoughts are about the future of their businesses. But also, um, Chris Mackey and the economic development team are really excited about looking at the economic potential along the corridor. Uh, so we will be doing that kind of work as a part of this evaluation process. Albert mentioned that, but I just wanted to highlight it because in this particular area, um, a ra the rail corridor has tremendous amount of potential to either harm or help um, if we plan correctly. And so we want to make sure we're helping and making it better uh, as we move along with the process. And then the last thing I want to mention is the schedule that Albert showed up there is the currently planned schedule. However, if there is no uh, transportation tax after 2020, that, that will be delayed dramatically. Um, and, we ha and even if it's just extended at the current rate, I don't know if that's the schedule for it. So I just want to uh, make sure you understand that you're looking at a schedule right now that we plan and think we can hit. But in the end, if, if, um, if there is not a local funding source to assist with that project, that project will be delayed from that date. So I just, I, I, I want to, you know, just be super clear with you all about, about that and how that, all, how all those pieces uh, fit together. And if I've said anything wrong, Albert, correct me. And if, uh, you said it all if right. I didn't say say enough, add what you think needs to be added to that. I think just the, the one thing, the one of the first slides I showed you regarding this study, and this will, read, this will be true for any study that we're doing that goes along with the Federal Transit Administration's process, that first box, which is called project development. In order for you to successfully get out of that box, you would have to have shown to the federal government that you have the local means to operate whatever capital investment you're seeking their participation from. So, which makes sense. They want to make sure that before they give you the capital investment that you need to be able to operate it as a local jurisdiction. In our case, that would be our local Phoenix transportation tax. So, as Rick said, at some point when we get through this process, we will be asked to be able to show that. And if we're not able to, then that's where our process would be held up. And at that time, we would have to see how that would affect the overall operation opening date. So, so it absolutely is critical for, for not just us, but for any jurisdiction seeking that type of participation. I guess my question is because regardless of which route you tie into the city of Glendale, is the city of Glendale participating in this? Uh, I, I mean, I hear all kinds of comments from different council members over there <laughs> on their preferences. Uh, but what you decide has a huge impact on what they're even discussing. So I'm hoping there's some type of coordination and hopeful they put some money in to help us study. They, they have. They, they have been a very active participating member. And, and honestly, it's been a really healthy discussion. When I say healthy, I mean that in a positive way between the City of Phoenix, City of Glendale, and Valley Metro that's managing all of this planning work for us. And thank you for that kind of segue into some of the comments I, uh, in regards to Glendale. If you notice on that map, there's kind of an area there that's a green box that's outlined. The reason why there's not a specific line is Valley Metro with the city of Glendale, they are going to be putting together what we've also done here in the city, what's called a community working group, and what that allows them to do with business owners and stakeholders in downtown. Um, if you're familiar with the downtown Glendale area, the right of way does start to pinch itself down. So you've got one lane in each direction. You've got a lot of nice historic businesses and, mm -hmm. and properties. And so all of those concerns and questions and ideas are all coming to a head now. And so what they're going to be doing is working with that targeted group. Now, as Phoenix, we're going to be not only just sitting on the sidelines, we are going to be a part of the discussion, for lack of better words, for mostly to understand exactly what you said, is that fundamentally when you're doing these between cities, although you're very mindful and respectful of those cities, you also understand that your infrastructure is now physically attached to each other. So whatever decisions are made regionally impacts everyone. So as they start to try to work through how, if it, if it happens to be light rail, then how does that work best with connecting to the downtown Glendale area? But do know that 
Right now, it's these two alignments as well as possibly light rail and or bus rapid transit. So there are still two modes being considered as well. Um, to date, all of these studies have resulted in a recommendation of light rail. Light rail does some amazing things and, and you all have heard a lot of those statistics. One thing light rail is tough at is being very flexible when it's trying to make its way through very tight corridors. And so that's a lot of what I think is going to be the discussions in downtown Glendale. They haven't started this group yet. They're, it's it's being planned now. I think they're actually getting recommendations from their city council as far as who should be participating in this. I know they've sent out a lot of invites to the Valley Metro. And so once that process starts up, uh, we'll, we'll be attending and listening and then obviously bringing back updates to you all to let you know how it's going. For instance, on 43rd Avenue, if that were to be built, um, do we own half the street and they own half? We, that is, the, so is that, that, that black dotted hash line there is actually the border between Phoenix, so Camelback and 43rd Avenue, that's, those are the actual borders of um, City of Phoenix and Glendale. Mm -hmm. They would be on the more east side of 43rd and we're on the west side. And then if, if something in the future were to happen to keep going west down Camelback, Glendale's on the north side and we're on the south side. So as your staff, I would do my best to make sure when, if it does go north on 43rd Avenue that everything's on the east side for a cost for something. <laughs> Good planning, Albert. No. <laughs> no, but but I mean, yeah, that's that actually is, the, that 43rd Avenue in Camelback becomes a very interesting piece because that's when both cities actually come together. Right. And uh, Camelback Road between um, the freeway and 43rd Avenue is also the, the dividing line between District 4 and District 5. Uh, so there's, there's going to be a tug of war. There's going to be a tug of war there too. There's so. a tug of war because uh, District Four is on the south side. Oh, District okay. uh, Five is on the north side, and there's a tug of war going on right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> regarding uh, Camelback. Uh, I have a right. question. Why wouldn't I mean if if Glendale is right there, the downtown Glendale, why wouldn't we continue going up on Grand? That that is a. Uh, uh, and Chair Williams and Councilwoman Pastor, that is one of the alignment options. I think just from some of the feedback that, that I've heard from City of Glendale staff and some of their, whether council members and or stakeholders, is just what are some of the economic development and revitalization they think that there might be more potential coming up 43rd Avenue and trying to get back onto Glendale. And, and that with Grand Avenue, just looking at some of the existing conditions, they're not sure how much opportunity there is for revitalization and economic development. But there is still a line there that we, we felt was worthy to at least getting it to this level three so we could look at it even closer. Uh, let me just add one other thing, and I apologize for inserting myself so much here. One other thing that, that the transit committee spent a lot of time talking about and they got a lot of feedback on is how do we connect to the Cardinals Stadium, uh, University of Phoenix Stadium in Glendale. And obviously the most direct connection would be all the way down Camelback Road. Uh, in the end, though, they wanted to be respectful of both the city of Glendale's interest in getting this to come through, uh, potentially through downtown Glendale, but also because Camelback Road is the dividing line and the entire right-of-way of Camelback Road is actually the responsibility of the city of Glendale. Uh, they felt like that had to be a, a joint dialogue as well. But we got a lot of feedback from the public about boy, wouldn't this be great to go to the Cardinals Stadium because we're so accustomed to taking light rail to baseball games, uh, to basketball games, and all the things that happen at the arena in the ballpark downtown and in downtown Tempe at their stadium. Uh, people are wondering, why, why are we not connecting up? And it's uh, truly, as, as, as the plan evolved, that was, I think you all kind of helped us winnow that down and cut that out for now. But that's also a possibility in the distant future uh, depending upon what Glendale wishes to do and what future Phoenix City Councils wish to do. Yeah, and that's one. That's also one thing that's going to be um, something that Valley Metro and City Glendale are going to be working through is as they figure out what that alignment is specifically in the downtown Glendale area, that it needs to allow itself to be set up to continue west because that's definitely the next step. So that's so what we're kind of describing here is why these things do tend to take several years because you're making even though it's very early in the process. There are decisions that are made and made for permanent infrastructure, so you have to be very mindful as we move these through. So. Councilman, do you have a question? Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I know in the not too uh, distant uh, past, Grand Canyon University has uh, supported the city of Phoenix, for example, with providing money for the some of the public uh, safety uh, that's provided out in that area. and. Um, 
I'm just wondering, is that, is there, are there any opportunities for, I guess, at least for this time, public-private partnerships, since it is a private university, as it relates to light rail? And if so, is that one of the considerations that's kind of being put into the formula here as you look at different routes? Uh, uh, Chair Wynn, Councilman Gates, we've had a very healthy relationship with Grand Canyon from the beginning, right when we started the study. I think uh, what we're doing now is going through a process where we need to finalize that alignment. And I definitely think that those are conversations that we would have with Grand Canyon if Camelback were to be the final outcome. If Glendale happens to be that, I think that changes the dynamics of the conversation. But it, once we get to the point where we have a locally preferred alignment, and if that alignment is Camelback, especially we are looking at placing stations there for mm -hmm. their students and their faculty, knowing that that formula would definitely work for us, that those are conversations that we would love to have with them. And just on top of that, knowing the relationship that they've had with the city of Phoenix. Good, because I mean, there's no question the value of their asset is increased greatly if um, uh, if, if the light uh, rail goes along that way. And as long as the lawyers are okay with us having that conversation, I think it's a conversation that we should be having. So I'm, so I'm happy to hear that uh, that we're moving in that direction. Yes, the, the president of the university and his executive staff, we, we've met with them several times. And, and obviously there's there's lots of conversations and questions that they have, and especially regarding construction, and but also knowing that the, the, how, the amenity that it would serve to their students. And also they, like with any university that's in the area that they are, as far as from a parking perspective, how this might be able to help them for parking yeah. and growing. So lots of healthy conversations. And so as we get to that point in this study, we definitely will be having that conversation with them as well. Yeah, thank you. Councilwoman Galeco, did you have any questions? I do not. Thank you so much. I think. Yeah, and then just the. I just this was just a slide to show you some of the different dynamics between light rail and our uh, bus rapid transit. You've seen this. Really, what it shows is how much we spend per mile. But but this is all information that you all have had. And uh, just the last part, I just wanted to make sure you understood that there's a lot of public involvement that has already been done, and a lot more that we still need to go through. To date, we've uh, had about 69 meetings with the community. Uh, the next two are listed there on June 3rd and June 4th. Uh, one will be in the city of Phoenix, one will be in the city of uh, Glendale. And as we work through these next several months, again, we hope to come back at the earlier parts of next year with an actual recommendation for this particular corridor. So more to come, just letting you know where we are. Thank you very much, appreciate it. The next is just, uh, just a real few uh, quick mm -hmm. slides on the, the Northeast Corridor study. I know this has been something that um, I've had the opportunity to, to work with Councilman Gates on at some, some uh, public meetings, and we always hear that question, when is the ball going to finally start rolling north at some point in regards to a lot of these uh, light rail type planning activities? So uh, we're here to talk about that. And, and just to start off, this is a, a corridor map. This looks a little different from that initial map because of some things that we've learned. It's actually expanded itself out. Uh, initially, this corridor study was between Central and Indian School, heading up the 51, going out towards Paradise Valley Mall. Just given what we've learned since we've been in operations of light rail and origins and destinations where people like to go and some of the activities, as well as some of the some of the uh, ridership that we have along 19th Avenue, and now that we soon will have uh, trains running up to 19th Avenue in Glendale, we thought that it would be a good idea to involve that area into the corridor. Um, in addition to as we've moved through the process, like Rick alluded to, that the the transportation tax that Phoenix is looking at, there were some modifications in regards to the amount of miles dedicated to this corridor. So given that, we wanted to make sure that as we move through this study, that we were mindful of the the miles that Phoenix had planned for this to make sure that whatever alignment options we had, that it real that it was realistic for the city of Phoenix. And so that's why we added that area on 19th Avenue, and Dunlap. And really, what we are going to be doing is is just like with the West Phoenix Central Glendale, looking at two particular areas. This is a very large study area, so it's gonna, we're gonna make sure that we do our due diligence and take our time, but answering two questions. What are the possible route alternatives for high capacity transit for this corridor? And then what is the appropriate transportation type? So we haven't officially started yet. The, the study is scheduled to start in just a few months here in July. We're gonna start at the, the beginning of the fiscal year. Of course, we're working close with your office, Councilman Gates, and if there's any particular meetings that you would be having that we could be on an agenda for to let um, some of your stakeholders know, or if there's certain groups you need us to talk to. But but just wanted to make sure that, that you all had first knowledge as far as uh, us getting finally started on the feasibility study to look at the Northeast Corridor. And Madam Chair, the same uh, subcommittee members, the same two issues apply here. The study area is very wide. 
but the line the line on the map that's uh, part of the transportation plan it's just it's too hard to understand when it's that big and so they uh, purposely put the shortest line uh, which is uh, coming up Dunlap up Cave Creek to Cactus because uh, one of the parts of what you all recommended, I think, at this subcommittee, at Councilman Gates' uh, suggestion, is to, to shorten up uh, what the route might look like to save money in the plan. We obviously were go are going to look at this entire corridor, but we do need, need to be mindful that if, if um, the transportation tax passes as presented, you know, we only have we will only have so much local money to put into it, and so either. Uh, it would it would be a longer line with other resources to come to bear, or we would we would focus more on the shorter uh, distances that connect up at, at in a shorter way to the existing light rail line. And actually, uh, we're hearing a lot of very positive feedback in the community about that possibility of having that sort of uh, line that goes across the north along Dunlap, and you know connecting to revitalization in Sunny Slope, but also connecting really Paradise Valley Mall with Metro Center. So you can go across the north part of the city uh, with light rail. Yeah, but you can um, too. And again, the same comment that if we don't have a local match in 2020, um, that uh, at that point, uh, we would have to push off this this project, obviously, from the expected date. But right now, our projected local match will be what's in the the transportation plan should it be adopted by the voters. Yeah, and just to add this, what we're doing here is, is truly a feasibility study, looking at this corridor and trying to identify what are, are there any fatal flaws with any types of particular alignments we have, and really trying to better understand if light rail, if, if light rail happens to be the technology, because on a feasibility test, you usually want to test light rail first, because from a capital perspective, light rail is usually the most costly. So if light rail becomes feasible, then you know that the other modes would be feasible as well. But but like Rick said, uh, now that the Dunlap area has become an area of interest, a possible option, there are a lot of good opportunities there between the hospital, there's the high school, a lot of revitalization opportunities. But we will work with Valley Metro and then Moving this through to to test the feasibility for the quarter, and okay. that's really it. It's just Any questions. A, I have a question in the feasibility study. Do you look at safety? And what I mean by that, do you look at crime rates? Do you look at the area uh, of what is happening within the area, um, and all the dynamics that a light rail would would then be placed in an area where there's some safety issues? So, uh, Chairwoman, Councilwoman Pastor, on a feasibility study, not traditionally we wouldn't do that. Feasibility study is mostly looking at it from a transportation perspective as far as ridership, right away, population, population growth, because a feasibility study really does begin to scratch the surface to find out what is technically feasible, does it actually fit. Now, once you get into when you're studying the actual alternative analysis or locally preferred alignments, like with the, with the West Glendale study as we move into it, you can start to better understand dynamics. Um, the one thing that we have that's unique, I think, in our region is the relationship between Valley Metro and, in our case, the city of Phoenix. Once we begin to move through these processes and start to ask those tough questions, we do have access to our police department, our economic development, our neighborhood resources, our parks department. So we develop these interdepartmental teams so that way we can better understand all of those characteristics. That will come, but in a, but in a feasibility study, we really want to just kind of allow ourselves to screen through what are the options that are even actually possible from a technical perspective? And then once we've answered that initial question, we would then go to the next level and start to ask, now that we know what's actually possible, let's start to ask the tougher questions regarding whether it's from a police perspective or from a neighborhood services perspective. And so that will happen. So um, I, I guess in my mind, your work, um, we should work backwards instead of forward. So and choosing a, a route, I feel that all the alternative analysis probably should happen beforehand before uh, choosing a route and then do the feasibility study. What it's sounding like, we do a feasibility study and then we go, say we choose two routes and uh, then we do the alternative analysis and if the alternative analysis doesn't land where it needs to land, you're only, you're with you're, you don't have many alternatives. You're stuck. 
that. And so at that moment, uh, what happens? I mean, I understand internal sure. departments come together, but we need resources in order to combat whatever is happening within those neighborhoods. Yeah, and Councilwoman Wines passed, uh, and Councilwoman Pastor as well. Is what you've just described is something that actually gets grappled with at a federal level too. Is trying to figure out, you know, how do you start to draw lines on maps and what, trying to identify all of the resources and all of the questions, and at the same time work within whatever funding you have at each level of these studies. So uh, we do allow ourselves a little flexibility here in this region because we hear that a lot on, on all of these alignments. Obviously, you know, wanting to know, well, how do I, as a whether it's from a city council person's perspective or whether it's from a neighborhood community perspective, how do you truly want my feedback with not understanding every dynamic of every option? And so what we try to do is do our best to, to address those different questions. And at the same time, when you're dealing with such large study areas, to try to see if we can identify major corridors that, that are within those larger areas and then be able to answer those questions. But from a feasibility study perspective, what we try to do is look at, can the train literally fit on this road? And if it can't fit on that road, when they won't have to ask all of those questions about that particular road, but where it can actually fit within a right-of-way perspective, then of course we need to quickly start to address all those questions. So what I'm trying to describe is that by no means are we trying to eliminate a bunch of options before we get to what you're describing. It's mostly from a fe feasibility studies do allow us with a great opportunity to say, there's no need to take people through a one or two year process if it never even actually could actually fit on that road. So. That's the balance that we have, and but by no means will we definitely do want to get to all of those questions, and and we will, and, and and we will with lots of options still to address. It's just a matter of from a feasibility perspective, we want to take this very very large corridor, and try to see what's actually feasible within that area. Madam Chair, Councilwoman Pastor, one of the things that we hear a lot is, gosh, why does it take so darn long to do these projects? Because as you see, we're we're starting on the northeast extension. Um, and it's not scheduled for completion in 2034. But one of the blessings that also comes with that is that we do have the time to address any of those issues. So for instance, we're talking, we, Rick mentioned today is that Chris Mackey with our Economic Development Department is looking to really maximize the corridor for the Glendale Camelback extension. Um, we also have a violence, um, the VIP, uh, prevention task force looking at safety issues. And so with a 10 year horizon before a corridor is um, planned to be opened, you do have time to tackle a lot of those issues in advance and prepare um, as part of that alignment and feasibility process. And let me just say in the end, so let's right now we have Albert showed three routes, I think, or four routes, I can't remember, for potential for the West Camelback. You guys ultimately get to decide, you and your colleagues get to decide, do we want to build it here or not? Uh, does this route make sense or not from our perspective? And, and so that's, I mean, that is the ultimate check that we have gone through a very thorough process, addressed the issues, and come to a conclusion about where a line ought to be built or ought not to be built. And we may come to you and rec even recommend a particular uh, conclusion and you all as a council may say, you know, this, we have concerns about this. This doesn't work for us, and we want you to go back to the drawing board. That, that is in your hands as part of this process. Plus, you also give us um, updates as the progress is made. Yes. And, and it's, you don't wait until you reach that point. I think that's what's important is you come back, uh, you tell us how you're proceeding and what the community input has been. Uh, not only from the community, but from our surrounding cities. And I think that helps us uh, evaluate the progress we're making. So Yeah, and thank that's you. why we're here today. And thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Done? Thank you very much. Uh, we will go to item number nine, accessible parking meter spaces in downtown. And I think this is a result of a uh, phone, couple phone calls I received about there was uh, no disabled parking. And yes. then the new meters were too tall for anybody in a wheelchair. So please tell us how you've uh, Great. I'll let Ray, and resolved it. I'll let Ray introduce our team, but you're exactly right. This is in response to something I think you asked for us to put on the agenda. Thank you, Rick, uh, Madam Chair and Council Members. Uh, thank you for th this opportunity. Uh, to my right, I have uh, Ben Carpenter, 
Uh, he's our parking manager. He actually started a couple of months ago, so he's our first ever, I believe, uh, parking manager for the city of Phoenix. So. Oh, we can blame him now. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, <laughs> uh, the credit for, for going forward. Oh, okay. The blame gotcha. before, yeah. credit you, after. Yeah, you can blame me if, uh, before. <laughs> also to our uh, to my right is uh, Peter Fisher. Uh, we, we have a great uh, relationship with Equal Opportunity Department, and so we've been working with Peter on, on a lot of these issues. Uh, to start off with uh, the, the, the question about the height of the, uh, of the meters, we did go back and, and redo those meters to the applicable uh, height. And... Uh, and we're still continuing to address that with all the, the all the uh, commercial uh, properties around the the downtown. So, so with that, let me let me have uh, Ben kind of just open up with the presentation. And if we have any further uh, questions, we we have uh, the team here to answer those questions. Thank you. All right, Madam Chair, Subcommittee members, thank you for having us here. So, first off, just really quickly, we wanted to go through uh, a brief history of how the Americans with Disabilities Act has related to parking. Uh, in 1992, uh, the ADA Act was adopted, uh, the 1990, and so what that really did is it talked about such things that parking garages needed to have accessible spaces. It also said that these spaces must have reserved signage, the accessible spaces must have minimum size requirements. And then again, in 1994, ADA Act addressed more specifically size requirements for, for parking garages. In 2005, the U.S. Access Board issued the first ever PROAG guidelines. PROAG stands for Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines. And they were the first to really address on-street parking. Uh, it specifically targeted new and remodeled areas, uh, addressed on-street parking by defining where a parking meter should be in a space, is the head of the foot, not the middle, as to disrupt people getting in and out of their vehicle. Also stated that ADA signs had to be present on an accessible space. Um, in this, though, there was, however, no mention of on-street minimums uh, for, for on-street parking, for parking meters. Uh, in 2010, the ADA design standards updated and specifically defined accessible space minimums for off-street parking. Didn't touch on-street parking, so just garages and parking lots. Sorry about that. So currently downtown, our accessible parking inventory, as you'll see on the next page, we have 44 accessible spaces downtown. That represents roughly 3% of our total meter spaces in the downtown area. Um, that currently exceeds the, um, the off-street requirement of 2% of all spaces. Uh, again, you can see it always is addressing off-street, not on-street. Um, what we do have, and you'll see on this next slide, is that our accessible parking spaces are really concentrated south of Van Buren. So it does give the sort of the perception that there is not enough accessible parking in downtown Phoenix. I think there's a couple that are cut off just north of Fillmore, but there are five above Van Buren and 39 below. Uh, this map's a little misleading in the sense that below Van Buren Street, that's all parking meters. Um, above it, we really only have parking meters on 1st Street, 3rd Street, and 5th Street. So, but you can see that there is room for a little more up there. So now that we've seen what is currently, currently in place, um, what are we going to do to improve this? Uh, per the national guidelines, as I said before, we do have a sufficient number of accessible spaces in downtown Phoenix. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't exceed those national guidelines. Uh, one thing that was not on the timeline is 2011, uh, U.S. Access Board proposed new PROAG guidelines that were not adopted um, that requested one accessible space per block of metered spaces. Uh, as again, like I said, that was not adopted. There was a lot of, uh, it was a little vague and the requirements were, and sometimes it's just not, not feasible. But that number of one space per block is something that we, talking with EOD and, and, and Peter Fisher, is something we want to strive for. We may not get there because it it's just might not be feasible, but we're going to be looking at each block to see what we can do. And we have up here is kind of what our timeline is moving forward. Uh, phase one, what we really want to do is review the policies in other cities. As, we, as I've seen looking, and, and I'm sure anyone else has, is it's really across the board of what policies are. Uh, some cities offer free parking throughout. Some have limits. Uh, so what we're going to do is catalog, analyze those, come up with some best practices of what works best for the city of Phoenix. Phase two, um, working with EOD and the Mayor's Commission on Disability Issues, we want to come up with a good comprehensive operational guideline. Um, as I said, there is no national standard for on-street parking. So what we want to do is come up with a standard for the city of Phoenix. 
Uh, phase three will be evaluating the need for new spaces. Like I said before, we want to have one per block. We don't know if that's possible. We're going to go through those areas that we don't have accessible on-street spaces, determine what would be a good place for those. Phase four, we're going to look at our existing spaces to see how they conform. Basically, um, the ones we have now, they're in the current right-of-way, so there are some areas that we can improve, and I'll address those in the next slide. Uh, phase five, we'll be developing a priority list in between those new spaces and the spaces that we need to improve. Um, we're going to come up with a budget to look at that in order that we can really make it most effective and cost efficient to, to expand the program. In phase six, we'll spend the next couple years after that to really make those improvements throughout. Now, I mentioned before on the last slide that uh, some of our current spaces might not be in complete compliance. Uh, because they're in the right of way, they've been so quote unquote grandfathered in um, before PROAG. So if you look at the, the picture on the left here, what you see, it's a perfectly fine looking meter. But what we want to do is look at all the accessible meters, is raise that sign up to uh, a minimum height of five feet. Also, you'll notice that it has the old, um, I should say current, but now in the city of Phoenix, the old um, international sign of accessibility. Uh, so what we'll do is, as you'll see, is all the signs throughout, we have the new sign it, down in the bottom left there, that's the new um, symbol. We'll be slowly rolling that out throughout as signs, we need to replace them, whatnot. The one on the right, the picture on the right, is what you can see there is that the access symbol on the ground is faded. Um, the, the aisle way to the right is faded. Again, the sign on the meter is, is low when it it's, could be higher and the, the curb is not painted blue. So those are just some of the things that we're going to be doing to the existing spaces. Now, in some cases, the existing spaces, we might not be able to improve. The construction may be too expensive. So we'll also look to take some and relocate them to areas that make a little bit more sense and, and be more cost effective. And right there, there's just another example of the two symbols, which uh, were thankfully approved by city. And so going forward, we're going to see that new symbol uh, all across the city, not just in parking spaces, but everywhere. And our next steps, as I said before, we'll be working with the ADA coordinator, Pete Fisher, and the Mayor's Commission on Disability Issues each step of the way to come up with uh, some proper guidelines of what, of what we really think is going to work for the future of Phoenix. Uh, we'll continue to work with the businesses on accessible parking needs. What we've done in the past is businesses will call and say, you know, we have a need for an accessible space in front of our business. We'll go out there and evaluate that. And if it, uh, we can do it, we'll do it. And sometimes they want a second or a third space. And we're always open to that. Um, we're also going to evaluate, and this goes back to one of the complaints, um, Madam Chair, that you did receive is the height of the meters. Uh, as Ray addressed, all of our accessible meters, the 44, do have a, a height of 48 inches to the, at the top of the screen, which is in compliance. What we're trying to determine now is if we need to have all of our parking meters be at that accessible height. Um, it's the, the thoughts are different throughout different cities, throughout different states. And again, for on-street parking, it's not defined. So one of the things that we'll be studying pretty hard is whether or not we to do that. And also, if it's going to be cost effective, uh, we did a pretty good investment into bike racks that are attached to meter poles. Those bike racks will not work if, if the meters are you know, cut down to uh, the accessible height. So it's just one of the things that we'll need to work on. And then uh, last, we'll be phasing in the new um, international symbol of accessibility all over. And just really quick, I'm going to go back to slide three. This parking meter right here is the one right on the northeast corner of Adams and 3rd Ave, right as you come out of the, the parking structure here. Uh, tomorrow at 1030, we'll be having a ceremony unveiling the new symbol. I'm sure you're aware uh, Mayor Sant will be speaking as well as members from EOD. That space now, we've, uh, we're changing it. We're, we've blue painted the curb. We're going to have a nice uh, symbol on the ground. The sign's going to be high. And so that is now going to be the space that all of our meters downtown will be striving to be over the next coming years. The reason I'm laughing is that's the, where I break up seeing there's one out there and I'm standing right across the street saying, no, there isn't. I did the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so thank, thank you. Thank you. So this item was uh, for information only. So. And, and I appreciate you taking this so seriously. Um, people have enough trouble without us uh, creating more for them. And we love the new parking meters. I'm very sorry we didn't stop to think uh, and somebody sitting there see the top of it and be able to read it. So I'm glad that you're correcting it and taking care of it. And I think this is very important. We want everybody to enjoy our downtown. 
and that means we need to have accessible parking. So thank you. Any comments, questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Do we have a sense of what percent of our population uses the accessible spaces? Um, not, uh, not. Yeah, Councilwoman Geigo, I, I and Madam Chair, I, I do not have those figures in, in front of me. Actually, Madam Chair uh, and the Council, um, last numbers I heard for Arizona was around six and a half percent. Six and a half percent. That's cool. that came from a DMV. Pretty healthy number. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And just, I would love it if we could look for opportunities to use our new open data policy and work with the downtown community to collect data about when the parking spaces are being used, which ones are most popular, which ones are often empty. Good idea. State. We'll, we'll get that information. Right. Staff has just affirmed they will follow yeah. through. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Gates. And Madam Chair, just kind of as a follow up on that too, we're you know pleased with uh, the advances that have been made. We're no longer using the 1930s uh, parking meter technology, so so we're happy about that. But expanding further, you know, working with with uh, with Pango and others to have the ability to you know look on your phone, see where um, the the spaces are available for people who are coming down here, you know, without having to drive around, uh, you know, many times. Uh, I think that that's that's definitely important. And then just a question too, because I just had this happen yesterday. Somebody who was trying to do the right thing and pay uh, to park in our parking meters, and they simply couldn't uh, they couldn't get it to work. Um, it's actually right across from U.S. Airways Center. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's our what's our policy on that? Because I think we may have with these technological improvements, we might actually have more situations where people simply cannot, for whatever reason, can't get it to work. I mean. What uh, what what have we done, or what policies do we have in place? If you know, heaven forbid that that individual uh, ended up getting a ticket. Uh, uh, Madam Chair and, and Councilman Gates, thank you. Um, yeah, it does happen. As technology goes, uh, you know, credit cards get stuck. Uh, you know, these things they they run on batteries. Sometimes the batteries die. I mean, these things do happen. Uh, in place right now, we have the, the our hotline number on every meter, and they call, and it goes to our meter technicians. It's been sometimes it's been six o'clock at night and I've gone out there and, and, and gotten some credit cards unstuck. Um, then we also have the, the, the downtown ambassadors that, that can assist and they give us a call and say, hey, you know, this meter's down. Uh, we, enforcement has uh, meter hoods that when certain meters may be malfunctioning, they will hood that for us and, and, and give us a report. If it does get to a point of uh, somebody doesn't deem get a ticket, um, they go through that process, and, and we have records in all of our meters saying, yes, indeed, this was down. Um, it wasn't hooded. The battery's dead. You know, they, they, this is our fault. So um, they, they do have ways to, to get around that. So it, it's pretty comprehensive. Thank you. Marvin, I think you wanted to make some comments. Yes, I did. I've got the mic on. Well, I'll talk as loud as I can. The mic doesn't seem to be working. It's on now. Yeah. Okay. What I wanted to talk about is the building at 101 North First Avenue, which is the RPTA light rail, uh, are in that building. There is no way to be able to unload a dialer ride in front of the building because they would be unloading me right into the light rail tracks. Right. On Adams, there is a garage that goes up to accommodate cars, but there is no place legally for them to park safely because they would have to pull in and back out of a parking space which has a light pole right in the middle of the street. On the other side of the street, which is on uh, Monroe, there is a ability to park. It's in a loading zone. I did get the building to agree and they did put in an automatic door on that side. So we need clarity as to where they can unload anybody for the RPTA light rail meetings. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you, Marvin. And staff's all nodding. They're going to act on yes. this. Yes, Madam Chair, we'll work yes. on that. Uh, any further questions? Well, we thank you for the presentation today. Um, look forward to you uh, coming back uh, later in the fall and telling us uh, your success and, and what you've accomplished. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll, thank you. We'll go to item 10, which is the October 2015 proposed bus service changes. Maria. Madam Chair, subcommittee members, I know this is the chair's favorite item every six months. <laughs> I cringe um, every time I see it. She this. wanted to know if we could skip it this time, but we actually need to uh, make some more changes in the fall. And so, uh, <laughs> Jesus and, and Joe Bauer from the Public Transit Department are going to kind of talk to you about uh, the, uh, the list of changes that we would like to go out and speak with the public about making in October. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll let Joe get into the details, but um, these uh, we feel are pretty simple. Uh, these changes are being made. Some of them are improvements to the schedule, but the two big things that we'll be talking about today are everything along 19th Avenue in the light rail construction area, basically putting it back to the way it was. Uh, the other thing are the service changes that we need to make, very good news uh, as well. Um, are some uh, route modifications we'll be doing in the fall because of the opening of the Desert Sky Transit Center adjacent to Desert Sky Mall, which is a really big deal for us. Um, and when we open that, we'll, we'll, we hope to see you all there. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Joe for the details. Well, good morning. Good morning. Chair Williams and subcommittee members. Um, this is our semi-annual process, and uh, Mr. Sapien indicated they're simple, but they're very uh, key elements of the changes for October of 15 and as mentioned the Northwest Extension light rail construction has progressed to a point um, where our partners at Valley Metro Rail have indicated that we can return our routes to the 19th Avenue uh, section between Bethany home and Dunlap uh, ahead of uh, any the opening which is still targeted for the spring of 2016 uh, this will eliminate the 19th Avenue connector which started in January of 13 and has been a very successful uh, free connector for between Christown and uh, Metro Center Mall and the 19th Avenue uh, route will return from it back to its original alignment this will allow the schedule some adjustments in the schedule will also return route 60 which is Bethany home to not uh, essentially go all the way around to get into the uh, 19th Avenue and Montebello Transit Center. So those are both mile revenue mile reductions and some savings. The uh, light rail program will reap about $700,000 in savings by opening earlier than the when the rail opens. So that is a that is a good thing and a plus. <coughs> Um, we have another change uh, on Camelback Road. Our partners in Scottsdale are wanting to end the Camelback Route 50 at the Scottsdale Road in Camelback and implement a trolley service of their own. This will be, they're planning a free trolley. Uh, the map shows you a little bit of the alignment and the routes they'll take. They're going to have a summer uh, loop in there, There's, but uh, that Camelback currently goes to Scottsdale Community College, so that route will, if approved by uh, the, the city of Scottsdale, will end at Scottsdale Road in Camelback. And as part of that, uh, our service between 44th Street and 64th Street, which is in the city of Phoenix, will see an increase in the frequency of the service in that reach. So that will be an improvement for us, and then uh, the Camelback trolley will cover the area in the city of Scottsdale. And they, they purchase that service from us. Right, so that was the clarification was that um, city of Scottsdale will actually pay for this portion of improvements. Very good. And our, another feature that is in, you know, a big milestone for us is the opening of the new Desert Sky Transit Center. Um, it's a long overdue improvement for the West Valley and essentially at the southeast corner of Thomas Road and 79th Avenue, 
moving over eighth to a quarter of a mile from its current location. And it, it'll allow uh, covered parking, you know, lots of shade, a lot of places to sit, a lot of good amenities. And with that opening in October of 15, we'll have to adjust some of the route schedules that serve that, uh, which is 75th Avenue, 83rd Avenue bus, the Thomas Road bus, the Mary neighborhood circulator, the I-10 West Rapid. And there's also a uh, Ajo Gila Bend rural connector that goes into the Desert Sky Transit Center. Madam Chair. Councilman. Just question on the covered parking there. Are we looking at um, doing solar? They will have solar. There will be 70 covered parking spaces. Great. Do, do we know how many KW or? Um, we can get those details. I don't think we know yet, um, but we can find that out. We can never generate more than we use. So. What I'm being told is it'll be a cost neutral site, so okay. that's a good thing. It'll Great. Be enough to run the site itself. Super. Good to hear. And then, uh, since we have a, some savings on the Route 19 and 60 and a reduction in revenue miles, we like to take these opportunities to improve some of the schedules and trips on other routes. This list is uh, inclusive of the routes we would like to do add a trip if it maybe during peak, extend the peak period. Or maybe if the one route ends a little earlier in the evening, we add another trip at the end of the evening. So we, again, our philosophy has been we're always at a net zero on our service changes. So this will allow us to make some improvements with the savings we gain on the Route 19 and the Route 60. And right now we are in the midst of our public outreach process from this is a regional process we do in, in cooperation with Valley Metro. From May 1st to June 1st, we'll have a public hearing on May 28th. The City of Phoenix, our staff will be going out and doing some intense outreach in the Northwest Extension Corridor, Metro Center Mall, Christown, to let the riders know that this change is forthcoming, those that have been using the 19 connector so that they can, uh, you know, if they have concerns or issues, they can provide those comments and let them be aware that this change is coming. Uh, with that, I think, uh, you know, this when, is for information only or any pardon. questions. When you say public outreach, how do you communicate that to them? I mean, I'm surely you're not saying you have a public meeting at the bus stop. I mean, there's got to be a better way than that. No, we go actually go out there. We'll just, sit, we'll go out, um, probably at two locations in this case, well, like at the 19th Avenue and Montebello Transit Center and then at Metro Center Transit Center. And we'll go out early morning and late afternoon to try to catch the most riders we can. We'll do that a couple times during this process. And then we'll have on and board announcements to let them know the changes okay. are coming. Plus then there's a the standard social media efforts. Yeah, Chair Williams, what we've learned over the years working uh, jointly with Valley Metro is we do this as kind of just an overall cohesive effort. We do um, uh, online tweet chats. We have the information online at Valley Metro, as well as City of Phoenix. We do the onboard announcements in English and Spanish. We literally have um, staff go out early mornings and afternoons at the stops or transit centers that will be most affected. So we use a multitude of, of, of methods to make sure that we're getting that input and that feedback. Um, and the joint effort with Valley Metro has worked very well. Um, we also have our, uh, our own public transit uh, Twitter account that we use. So we're always using a multiple, multitude of method, uh, methods to get that word out. But um, I think the key thing for us is uh, letting people know that the changes are coming and letting them know in anticipation of those changes what those slight tweaks will be, especially in the Northwest Extension and Desert Sky area. Councilwoman, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question in regards to um, also possibly having um, some information when they're buying their bus cards or when they're buying the passes to be able to hand something to them and say, here are changes happening. My other question is, um, is about, does anybody ride the bus in the morning at peak time and is able to then sit, in, I guess, in the front or the back or wherever and to say, hey, there's going to be changes. What do you think about Because um, uh, usually, unless there's standing time, uh, you're there early enough and the bus isn't there, then you can get people. But if they're in a hurry and they're in a rush, they're not going <laughs> to, I'm getting on the bus, 
ride with me. But uh, at least you, someone could ride with them and, and get more information, at least. Ch Chair Williams, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, what we've actually found is very effective. We do what, what are called uh, door hangers, and we hang them throughout mm -hmm. the bus. Oh, um, yeah. The reason we do that is because some of these routes have a trip every 8, 12, 15 minutes. So it would be some of these have hundreds of, <laughs> hundreds of trips every day. But we found very effectively, again, in our joint efforts with Valley Metro, we do, um, it's literally a long hanger, front and back. And it has a, a, a summary of what those changes are. And we place them throughout different areas of the bus to make sure that people are grabbing those. If they do want very detailed information, it has phone numbers, emails, uh, the web address where they can find a um, route by route map of what the changes are. Most of these are going to be schedule adjustments more than an overall change in the route. But we found that to be very effective. And uh, several of us in transit do ride the bus every day. And we make sure those are on there and that people are taking them. Very effective method we found. We do have a card, Greta. Would you like to comment, please? Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Um, my question regards ridership. And do we have studies that are done regularly to show ridership at maximum hours of use and minimal hours of use? And the reason I'm asking this is because it's twofold. Uh, public transportation nationwide is a losing money operation. And you know that, and I know that, and most citizens who pay any attention to government know that. Um, I frequently, in driving in different parts of this city, which I, I do with regularity, uh, notice that after the morning rush hour, buses are very sparsely used, i.e. people seated. Um, it would seem to me it might be worth considering, instead of running these full-size buses, which are expensive to operate, and or the tandems, that we look at using the circulator size buses from, say, 9.30 in the morning until three in the afternoon or whatever time you know that the rush hour in the evening begins and that the rush hour in the morning has completed itself. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have staff uh, research that and get back to us. Appreciate it. Anyone else want to make any comments? I do. Oh, please. During the reInvent Phoenix process in the Gateway Corridor, we received a lot of feedback on bus connectivity, sort of in the general area of 32nd and Van Buren. Would it be possible to take the information we received in that process and use it as a part of our reevaluation of the bus line? Absolutely. We, uh, that's something that we, we work very closely with uh, various other departments, planning and um, uh, streets and and we do get that input regularly uh, when those studies come up we generally sign a staff member to participate so yes the answer is yes we can take that information and use it for planning purposes so madam that would be wonderful thank you councilwoman gallego i just want to um, mention though that in anticipation of these october service changes um, the, it would need we would have needed to have included it yes. already um, so what we will do is make sure that we do include it for our april service changes yeah, and Van Buren is included as a schedule change adjustment, so we'll look if, at if it, uh, if that it particular area. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Any further dialogue, discussion? Hearing none, thank you very much for the presentation. Yep. Brings us to call to the public. Uh, Greta Rogers. Greta. Greta. Did you want to make public comment? May I your you may. No. Very good at <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I want to comment on the um, proposed transportation ballot plan. And you know how I feel about it, so I'm not going to re-express my 
opposition to it. But one of the things that is of great concern to me is the loss we take on each boarding. On buses, the loss we take on each boarding is 81 cents, 84 cents, excuse me. On light rail, it's 81 cents. We paid $8 million to APS last year for the generosity of their electricity to run the light rail. These things must be considered. And the reason they must be is because projections of what a percentage of tax is going to produce have historically, consistently historically, been wrong. They produce less. And this is in good times, not just when we went down the tubes by our own mismanagement before the recession hit. We have got to be more concerned about costs and realistic about costs, because it doesn't grow on trees. And there is a limit to what people are going to approve of additional tax. I know that we pay tax because we live in a democracy, and it is the resource for operating the government. I don't care what level you're talking about. That's our resource. And I don't mind paying it if we're getting a, a commensurate return for investment. But I seriously object to paying it and getting screwed. If I want to be screwed, it'll be on my terms, at my time, and my place. So you need to be doing much more inquiry and demanding much better research into this stuff than has presently been provided and has been than has been provided for all the years I've been active doing this stuff. Now 15. So thank you. Thank you, Greta. I think uh, those are wise words. Uh, next on our agenda, I believe, any future items? Have anyone have any suggestions, recommendations? Or, all right, hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you.